Hi, I'm Huynh Tuet Dao. I am an Android developer. I work on the Trello app at Atlassian, and I am a complete fanatic about custom views in Android. And it's kind of interesting because you know the Android platform provides us with so many wonderful components, lots of functionality, and you may wonder to yourself, why would I ever want to write my own custom view? Well, there's several pretty good reasons. Uh, the first one is custom looks and behavior. You know, we all uh, want to create apps that are very unique, that uh, reflect brand identity, and a lot of times we can get that out of the platform components, but sometimes we can't. And sometimes we have to kind of go out of the bounds of what Android provides us and do something a little bit different. So custom views can help you with that. Custom views can also help you create more reusable modular code, words that we all have associated as being wonderful things for our code bases. And custom views can help you break up very complex, very uh, intricate UIs into more maintainable, reusable pieces. And finally, performance. Performance is actually one of my favorite topics when talking about Android and UIs in particular. And there actually can be some performance issues that you can have with layouts in Android, and custom views are just one solution to kind of help you circumvent these performance problems, and we'll talk about that in just a little bit. Now, why don't you want to use custom views? There's actually a lot of good reasons. The number one is that they're difficult. And they're difficult for several reasons. Number one is that you have to do everything by yourself. So the nice thing about doing, you, doing UIs with Android platform views is that everything is done for you. Uh, drawing, interactions, animations, accessibility, they're all available out of the box. And if you want to do custom views in Android, to some degree or another, you're going to have to do one or all of these things on your own. And they just become time consuming. There are many late nights where you might spend tearing your hair out, wondering why, why does this not draw draw correctly, and it's, it's kind of, it, it is definitely a value, you have to kind of weigh the value of the time that you put into doing custom views versus the benefit you get out of it. But I think overall, um, it's great to learn how to do them. It can te teach you so much about how Android works, about how Android draws views, and even if you end up not using your own custom views, things like performance, things like debugging become a lot easier when you understand how all of these pieces work. So today, I want to talk to you about several things. Um, the first is how Android draws views, because this ties in very, very uh, tightly into how you create your own custom views. I'll talk about different ways to go custom, and I'll talk about three different things uh, in kind of the reverse order that I have them in the title, but we'll talk about how to draw in custom views. We'll talk about how to measure views, and we'll talk about kind of how view groups, doing custom view groups, differ from doing views, and then finally, we'll talk about layout. So first thing, how does Android draw views? Uh, draws its views. So the first step when you're kind of creating your lovely Android applications and you have your lovely, lovely XML file filled with your view hierarchy is instantiation and inflation. So basically every single element, every single tag and that XML is instantiated, is inflated, is created and then parents have, uh, create their children and so on and so forth. So you have this lovely tree, this lovely view hierarchy. So once you have all of that completed and it's come to life, it's not quite ready for the screen yet because three separate things have to happen. Those are measure, layout, and draw. So each of these is a phase. Each of these is a processing of that view hierarchy to get it ready to draw to the screen. And each of these phases is basically a depth first traversal of that view hierarchy from the root down from parent to children. And each of these phases does something to the tree just to get it a little bit more ready for drawing to the screen. So, as developers, we have three entry points into the system. Uh, the first is on measure, the first is on layout, and the third is on draw. So each of these is a method that you're going to override to kind of insert yourself into this process. And so, on measure. Uh, on measure is kind of like that first entry point into this process, and what happens in on measure is that a parent that has several child, uh, child views, will pass each of those child views some constraints, some bounds on how big that child can be, and that child will take in those constraints and figure out how big it wants to be given its content and given those constraints from the parent. And it'll use those, that information to generate some measured width and height, its desired width and height, and then kind of store it inside of itself and wait for the parent to retrieve that information later. Now, in the course of determining its measured width and height, that child will probably measure its own children uh, and include that in its calculations and so on and so forth uh, until the entire tree is measured. Now, next comes layout. Now, layout is actually the positioning and sizing of views on the screen uh, by the parent uh, for each child. And so each child will go to each, each of its children and actually size and position it as it will be finally on the screen. This is a kind of like a final 
um, last go at sizing and positioning that child. And again, it's step for uh, traversal, so from parent to children, and so on and so forth. And finally, once we've measured everything and laid it everything out really neatly, um, the view or the view hierarchy can be drawn. And again, this is depth first traversal. The parent draws itself first, and then send messages to each of its children to say, "Hey, you can draw yourselves as well." And kind of a um, effect of this process is that because the parent draws first, uh, child views are always on top of the parent in terms of how they're drawn in the hierarchy. So that's how Android draws views. So what can we do with this whole process? So there's a lot, a lot of different ways to actually make custom views. There's a really great blog post written by Lucas Rocha, who works at Facebook, and he actually names kind of three of his favorite types of uh, custom views and view groups. I added in one for myself, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about each of these. So I'm going to kind of categorize it by both the thing that you're extending and um, the, the thing that you're extending and the class that you're extending from. So if we're talking about views, just plain old views, view, things that don't have children, the most basic and easiest way to get into custom views is actually just extending an existing widget or component like text view, image view, and things like that. And that actually was my kind of gateway drug into custom views. So I was at a job a while ago, and we had a lot of forms, right? And we were supporting down to Gingerbread because back then, you know, it was a really cool thing to, to, to be compatible with Gingerbread. Now it's just kind of like a sad thing that you might have to do sometimes. And we had all these input types. We had tons and tons of forms. And there were a lot of input types that we wanted to use to kind of do like verification on our forms. But some of them weren't quite compatible with Gingerbread. And rather than copy and pasting the same Java code over and over again in activities, I basically extended text view, backported those attributes, and then I could use that in place of kind of all that extra copy and pasting. So that's kind of like your kind of primary uh, elementary version of kind of custom views. But you can take it many, many steps forward and do what Lucas calls a flat custom view. So rather than extending a existing widget or existing kind of image view button, thing like that, you can actually extend the base view class. Now, the cool thing about this is that when you do that, you get to do uh, all of the cust all the drawing, all the interactions yourself. You take total control of how that view is rendered to the screen, which is exciting and extremely terrifying because everything you have to do on your own. But there's benefits. Again, you have total, complete control over how this view looks, how it draws, how it behaves. And you can also get some performance as well. You can imagine that sometimes you might have to group components together to get a behavior that you want. But imagine being able to create a view where you are totally like master of the domain and like you can do everything you want. Um, that is like the power of flat custom views. So how about view groups? So today I'm actually going to kind of uh, narrow my focus to uh, composite view groups. So basically composite view groups are view groups that are, are, are components that are made by combining, combining other uh, smaller components. So you think about maybe combining image views, text views, and creating a brand new component out of it. So Lucas talks about just kind of regular old composite view groups. And you, you create these cust uh, composite view groups. There's a lot of C words, so I'm going to mix them up a little bit. Um, so composite view groups are made when you, say, extend a linear layout or a relative layout, and you have a specific um, static set of children that lives in that view group and that you're going to do some kind of logic, some kind of magic with, right? And usually you might want to do this when you want to create kind of modular UI pieces. Say you have a really complex UI, it's getting unmanageable, and you want to break it up. You want to break that logic up to make it a little more maintainable. Uh, co composite view groups are great for that. You can also do it for layout reuse. So on that job that I mentioned before, we had tons and tons of forms. It wasn't a very fun app. And we had this kind of one section that had like customer information and some like error handling and verification stuff that we were doing. And so rather than, again, copying and pasting that code everywhere, we just extended, I think, linear layout or something, added that custom handling in there, and then just dis disseminated it throughout the uh, app. So again, custom view groups are really great for these kind of two things, kind of like really good maintenance and cleanup type stuff. Now, if you wanted to get really crazy, which we are going to do, you can do custom composite view groups. So rather than extending an existing platform layout, like linear layout or relative layout that has all that great layout logic for you, you can do all of it on yourself. You can measure everything by yourself, lay out everything by yourself. And again, it's terrifying, but it gives you so much ability and so much power to do things with that view group. Now, generally, you might want to do this if you are just thinking you have a great idea for a custom layout. And you, OK, I'm going to make this like clock layout, right? And I'm going to like have all of the views in a circle. And I'm going to do some kind of cool, like, uh, like I don't know, it's like spinning animation, something like that. It allows you to kind of actually implement all of that cool behavior on your own. But kind of the more, the less crazy and maybe more pragmatic way of using com custom composite view groups is for performance. 
So performance issues with layouts tends, tend to happen when you have very nested view, uh, view hierarchy. So when that view hierarchy gets really deep and you have like views within views within views. Um, custom view group, custom composite view groups can help you with that because a lot of times when we're nesting things, it's usually to get something looking the way that we want to look. So you know, you put a linear layout in another linear layout, but then you need a relative layout for this part, right? You can kind of see how that starts to snowball. And that's when layout uh, issues can happen. Um, what's really interesting is that relative layout, if you don't know this, um, relative layout's really powerful, right? It allows us to kind of specify relationships between views. But in order to actually resolve those relationships, relative layout actually does measure and layout twice. So as you can see, if you start nesting relative layouts and relative layouts, the performance impacts start getting exponential. And so, and, and, and that's kind of like the trade-off, right? The platform view groups and platform layouts are really great because they're really flexible. You can give them an arbitrary set of views and they'll handle them just fine, but that comes with overhead. That comes with these kind of extra little uh, provisos and, and kind of things that it has to do to give you that robustness. If you don't need that, if you need performance, if you're finding that your layout is dragging and you have a very specific layout that you can kind of describe in code, you can use a com a custom composite view group to take care of that, and that will give you that performance that you need. So, as I said, we're just going to go ahead and go crazy and talk about the last two uh, types of custom views today. And we'll talk about custom, flat custom views first. So, when you're thinking about doing custom views and view groups, the number one question is, which of these three methods do I have to override and how am I going to do it? So, with custom views, flat custom views, uh, it's pretty simple. The answer is, you only really have to implement on draw and it's pretty obvious why, right? The view needs to render to the screen, and that's why you have to implement on draw. But I will tell you that while you don't have to, implementing on measure is really, really handy. It actually helps you increase the reusability and flexibility of that view, and I'll actually show you why in just a minute. So for this very simple example, I'm going to uh, build a tally counter for you. So it's basically one of those things when someone stands in a line and tries to count people as they go along. Um, and I'm an engineer, so I'm not very good at design, so this is my attempt at making it somewhat pretty. Uh, not too pretty, actually, but kind of for the purposes of this example, um, all right. So this has nothing to do with the view, but I actually provided an interface for my counter, so I have methods like resetting it, incrementing it, um, getter and setter for the count, that kind of thing. So how about the actual making the view part? So first part of making any class usually is the constructors. So when you're building a custom view, you have to pick which of the base view constructors you want to override. So the simplest one is the first one you'll see in the file uh, if you kind of click through to the view class. And that constructor takes one parameter, it's context. It's the context in which the view lives. It's how it accesses themes, resources, all of that good stuff. And you basically will be calling this constructor when you instantiate your view using the new operator. The second one you'll pretty often see is this one. It takes one extra parameter apart from the context, and that's an attribute set. Now, normally, uh, or very frequently when we're making UIs, we're, we've got an XML file, and at some point that XML file is inflated. So the constructor for the view class that takes these two parameters is the constructor that's called when you create this view as part of that XML inflation process. Now, there's two more constructors, which I'm not going to go through. Um, they have a lot to do with themes and attributes and defaults. Um, if you're really interested in what these do, uh, my esteemed colleague, Daniel Liu, uh, over at Trello wrote a really great uh, post, uh, kind of deep diving into them. So for this, for this uh, talk, though, we're just going to talk about the first two. And so for my tally counter, I have my first two uh, constructors. So the first one's for the new operator. The second one's for XML inflation. And I'm going to kind of cheat a little bit. I'm just going to direct uh, the first constructor to my second one. And in the second one, I'm going to go ahead and start doing the work of getting ready to draw. So. When you draw a view, you're going to draw with different objects. And these are paint objects, kind of cool. It's like a nice little metaphor of like drawing and paint and everything like that. So as I'm going to draw my uh, custom view, I'm going to need some paint objects. So the paint objects are basically just holder objects for different attributes that you can apply to your drawing operation. So fill color, stroke width, that kind of stuff. There's also a text paint object, which is a subclass of paint that holds text-specific attributes like text size. So for my tally counter, I'm going to in, uh, instantiate three paint objects, one for my pink background, uh, one for kind of a rando line that I decided to throw in there because I'm an engineer and what do I know about design, and one for actually drawing that, uh, the number for rendering that text inside my tally counter. And then um, something interesting is that when you're drawing, every single operation that you do is in terms of pixels, 
But as Android developers, we've had it beaten to, into our heads that we need to use DPs and SPs for flexibility, different screen resolution and sizes. So whenever you're doing a custom view, you're going to have to do a bit of math. And so here, if I want to make sure that my, say my text is rendering at 64 SPs, I got to do a little bit of multiplication. So I'm going to take my value 64, and I'm actually going to go into the resources, grab the display metrics object, and pull out the scaled density property. And that's basically the factor that I have to multiply um, any SP value by to get the pixel value. And so that's what I'm doing here for my number paint. And then um, when you're drawing, you're going to need a lot of helper objects. So drawing has a lot of ge geometric objects. They're going to use like points and rectangles. So a good place to instantiate them is actually in your constructor. And I'll explain it why in just a minute. Um, and then you'll probably need things like corner radiuses. So this is probably a good place to pull it out if you're kind of specifying them in styles and things like that. And finally, because I have my nice tally counter interface, I'm going to go ahead and uh, kind of initialize the state of my counter. So the fun part, drawing. So when you override on draw, you're going to get one parameter, and that's a canvas. So the canvas is where you're going to be painting your uh, view onto, and it's kind of where you can kind of um, do all these cool operations. So just to keep in mind, this is that really lovely tally counter that I designed, that, and that's kind of where we're kind of heading towards with all these draw operations we're about to do. So first thing, I'm going to go ahead and, because my background takes up the entire uh, kind of width and breadth of my uh, tally counter, I'm going to go ahead and get the canvas width, canvas height. And because I want everything nicely centered, I'm going to do some math calculating of the center of the canvas. And then I'm actually going to draw something. I'm going to draw that first background shape, with, which is a uh, rounded rectangle. And so basically, I'm going to take that rectangle object that I initialized before, my little helper, and I'm going to set the bounds of it, the top left, right, and bottom. And then I'm going to pass that to the draw round rect method on the canvas. So passing it that rectangle, passing it some quarter radiuses, uh, radii, and then passing the paint. And that will actually do the work of drawing my background. And then I also have a line that I'm drawing kind of in the middle there at the baseline. So similarly, I'm going to do some calculations for where I want to position things and then call canvas.drawLine, pass in um, start endpoint, end, end endpoint, and then some paint. And then text. Um, text is always really fun, and I say that in both an honest and sarcastic way uh, in terms of Canvas. Um, there's actually kind of more uh, easier ways of doing text painting in, uh, when you're drawing on the Canvas, but for now I'm just going to do it kind of the most manual way. And what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to measure the width of my text because I want it really nicely centered inside of my Canvas. And there's actually a great method on text paint objects called measure text. You pass it in a string or a character sequence, and it lets you know how many pixels wide it should be. So I'm going to do some math on that, figure out the center point, and then finally, after all that math, um, call draw text, passing in my character sequence, uh, some kind of position, and then some paint. And the result of all this is my lovely tally counter. Um, as you can see, I've got my text rendered nicely in the center. I've got my lovely loud pink background, um, and there's my tally counter. Um, but there's a problem. So I have a click button, which is going to be how I increment that counter. And if I start clicking on it, uh, nothing happens. And I actually threw a toast in there to, pro to promise you that I didn't like forget to hook up the click list or anything. Um, so what's the problem here? So the state of my tally counter, the actual count of my tally counter is changing, but I'm not actually doing anything to the view to update the, rendered, the, the rendering of that state. And it's really actually easy to do, and it's just one of the things you have to remember when doing custom views is that you have to reflect state changes. And to do that, in order to kind of let the view know that it, its state needs to be updated, its drawing needs to be updated, you're going to call invalidate. That marks the view as dirty. And the next time that measure layout draw uh, pass happens, that's when that view is going to say, hey, you know, I need to be redrawn. And then Android will go ahead and redraw your view at some point in the future. Um, it doesn't happen immediately, but just the next time that um, measure layout and draw happen. Now, there's actually another version of invalidate that takes kind of a bounding box of left, right, top, and bottom, and that allows you to be a little more precise. So Android is actually pretty good these days about optimizing these drawing calls, but you can actually give it a little more help by saying, hey, this specific like, kind of region of my view is dirty, and that kind, of help and that kind of helps Android optimize that process even further. So how can I make my tally counter um, respond to these state changes? So here's the implementation of my tally counter. And as you can see here in the set count method, I'm you know, recording the count, I'm calculating kind of a new string to display, and that's it. I'm actually not kind of letting the view know, hey, you need to be redrawn. But to fix that, all I have to do is call invalidate. 
And as soon as I add that one method and go back to running my application, once I start clicking on the button, yay, the tally counter works. And as you can see, it's it's pretty simple process. It's just something you have to remember to do. But that's basically kind of like how you're going to start getting this behavior out of these views. Remembering to draw it, uh, reflecting the state, and making sure that you invalidate that state whenever something changes. So some things to remember when drawing. Um, don't ever allocate methods, or, or don't allocate objects in on, in on draw ever, ever, ever. And in fact, if you do, Lint will yell at you. Um, really don't do this. So the thing is, is that draw gets called a lot. Basically, anytime anything on your screen changes, some draw is happening. So it's really easy to see that if you start allocating objects in draw, you're going to be churning through a lot of memory. So no, don't, do, don't do that. And to help you with this, make sure that you only that you invalidate only when you need it. So only when you're actually changing the state of that view, and try to let Android know what you're invalidating using those kind of more precise kind of bounding box versions of invalidate. Um, something that kind of always gets me every single time I do custom views is that checks is positioned at the baseline. So if you're not familiar, base, the baseline is kind of like that imaginary uh, line where text is on top of. Uh, some letters might hang below it. A lot of letters kind of uh, jut above it. But um, text is actually positioned at the baseline and not at the top left corner, as most objects you think would be. Um, I think every single time I've done a custom view with uh, text, I will run it the first time and notice that all my texts have kind of like started to float up in the air. And that's because I've forgotten that text is positioned at the baseline. So don't forget. Um, and finally, uh, draw in, P uh, in pixels, but always remember to think in DP and SPs. Probably you've heard it a million times now, but worth noting that even if you're doing custom views, uh, DPs and SPs for uh, ma making sure that we are flexible and adaptive to screen sizes and screen resolutions. So here's my tally counter again, but there's actually kind of a hidden secret. <laughs> it's not that exciting. It's actually kind of a sad secret. Um, if you look at the uh, layout, XML layout for this um, activity, there's a button, my tally counter, and then another button that is completely hidden. Um, it's basically kind of fallen off the edge of the earth, poor thing. Um, why did this happen? So if you look at my tally counter, its height is set to wrap, wrap content. The problem is, is that that default implementation of on measure that lives in the base view class doesn't actually account for much. It will take whatever like, space is available to it and, and just use it all. And that's what's happening right now. Even though you know, the text isn't taking up that much space, as far as my tally counter knows, it can use up all the space that the parent gives it, and that's what's happening. And that's why I kind of said before that even though it's not mandatory to use on measure, it's actually a really good idea because when you kind of omit on measure, there's no way for your view to know kind of its intrinsic size and how big its content is. And so by implementing on measure, you give your view some sense of how big it needs to be. So we can kind of go ahead and retrieve that button by going through measurement. So let's talk about measurement in views. So measurement is really interesting. It's something that it took me a while to understand, but it's actually pretty fascinating. View measurement in Android is actually a negotiation between the parent and the child. So that negotiation starts uh, in XML or Java. So basically, a child will kind of request how big it wants to be, or basically how, how it wants to be sized from the parent using layout params. So you think of the uh, familiar layout width and layout height. Those are layout params. You can also do them in Java kind of explicitly. But it's basically how a child view um, tells its parent how it wants to be laid out. And basically, you, at some point, set layout params is going to be called on that child. And the parent will later retrieve those layout params uh, via get layout params. So, once the parent has kind of gotten this information from the child, it's actually going to do some thinking. It's going to determine from both the child's requested sizing and the constraints on the parent itself, basically how much space that child can have. What are the constraints on that child's size? And it's going to communicate those constraints to the child via measure specs. So measure specs are really simply int, ints that encode both a mode and a size. And together, these communicate to the child Hey, you can be at most some size, so you can be size up to some, some quantity x. You should be exactly this size. Or you have unspecified constraints, meaning you can be however big you want to be. Now, once the, ch the parent has determined some constraints, some measure spec for the child, now it's back to the child. Now it's the child's turn. So the child's going to take the information of how big its content is and how big the parent is going to let it be, and it's going to determine some desired width and height. It's measured width and height. Um, it's going to calculate it and then call set measured dimension on itself. Now, really important to remember is that if you're doing all this craziness, if you're overriding on measure, you have to, have to, have to 
call set measure dimension, otherwise you'll get a runtime exception. And so this measured, this measured width and height, it's pretty interesting because it's basically kind of a statement by the child that doesn't necessarily have to be respected by the parent. So if you ever see a layout that you think should be one size but ends up being something else, there's usually some kind of discrepancy between what the child has asked for and what the parent has actually given it. Um, but you can actually retrieve these measured width and height using get measured width and get set measured or get measured width and get measured height. No surprise. Um, and so after the child's measured itself, now it's finally the parent. So the parent makes the ultimate decision about how big the child's going to be and where it is on the screen. And it does this in the layout method. So basically when the parent calls the layout method on the child, that determines the child's final size and position. So this process is like a really kind of complicated sounding back and forth, but there's a lot of methods that you can kind of call on to help you with this. And it ends up making on measure not too bad to implement. So, um, in the code that I have here, I actually kind of cheated a little bit. So there's a really great helper method inside of Vue called resolve size. It's got some flags and other things that we don't, that I wanna wanna talk about today. So here's kind of a simplified version of it, which I'm gonna call reconcile size. So again, it's, this is gonna do the hard work for you of reconciling what the child wants with what the parent can give it. And just to kind of give you a quick overview, this is what it looks like. So basically, you feed into this method for either the width or the height, the content size, basically the size the child wants to be, and the parent's also gonna give in um, a measure spec, basically how big it can be, and then through the switch statement, basically, um, if the parent says you have to be exactly some size, well then there's no argument, then you're basically gonna be that uh, specified size that the parent gives you. Um, if the parent gives you an at most mode, then basically it compares the child's desired size, that content size with the specified size. And basically if the child is within those bounds, cool. If not, then it just defaults to the parent's size again. And finally, if, there's an us if it's given you an unspecified mode, then cool, you, the view can be whatever it wants to be. Now again, in reality, you should use uh, view.resolve size, but that's basically what's going on under the hood. And it's a really handy function to call on uh, when you're doing on measure just to kind of simplify things for yourself. So going back to my tally counter, um, I need to measure a bunch of things. So when you're doing text especially, a really handy object is this font metrics thing. So as its name might imply, it gives you a lot of information about the font. Basically, how high it can be for the tallest glyphs and how low it can be for the, the lowest ones. And it can allow you to help, it, it can allow us to kind of estimate and calculate the size of text. So for this particular tally counter, I'm gonna be a little bit lazy. I'm just gonna kind of estimate maximum width and maximum height to give my uh, tally counter a rough idea of how big it can be. So I'm gonna actually say, okay, well, I think nines are usually pretty wide. So let's say that the biggest number of my tally counter gonna, is gonna be is 9,999. Um, and I encoded that in max count string. So when I'm actually measuring my tally counter, I say, okay, well, here's as big as I can be, measure that text. And I'm gonna guess at how high it can be. Now, this is just like a quick warning. Uh, for some reason, uh, measuring height, text height in Android is really hard. Um, and like different fonts will kind of, it's kind of weird. When you, when you look at font metrics, sometimes the metrics don't quite line up with what you're seeing. Um, so there can be a lot of like trial and error and finagling a little bit. But for this case, I'm gonna actually just take the top of the font, which is basically um, the highest that it thinks it can be, and the bottom, which is basically the lowest it thinks it can be um, on either side of the baseline, add those together and say, okay, that's my roughly my maximum text height. Now, I'm gonna actually like, let the tally counter decide how big it wants to be, its desired width. So I'm gonna take that max, max text width and add in the padding, left and right, and then I'm gonna do very similarly for the height, take that max text height, I'm gonna multiply by two because I want a little extra room, and then add the top padding and the bottom padding, and then, so here I have my desired width and desired height, and then I'm gonna feed that into my reconcile resolve size method, um, pass in the parent's measure specs, and then let that method figure out, uh, I, guess, I guess fight the battle of who's gonna win between the parent and the child about how big the child's gonna be, and then finally call set measured dimension. All right, so it's not too much code, about what, like 15 lines? Um, with just those 15 lines of code and a little bit of um, calculation, I have now turned my tally counter into this lovely better sized um, view. And as you can see, my reset button has come back from the ends of the earth. And as you can see, um, this makes this view a lot more flexible. I can start popping it in into other layouts without it worrying about it taking up all the space. And that's why on measure is so powerful and kind of really worth looking into um, as you're uh, working with your custom views. So 
really quickly, I have about 11 minutes left to really take you all into view groups. So um, let's kind of go give a quick overview on how view groups are a little bit different than uh, views and, and how roughly you can um, implement them. So again, kind of that uh, question of which of the three methods do we have to implement when we're doing custom view groups? So draw, just don't worry about, worry about draw. There's, I, I can't even think of a, many situations where you'd actually want to draw for a view group. And that's because a view group's entire purpose is to um, collect and position a, uh, a group of child views. So really there's not much left for the view to do. It's there for organization and positioning. Um, and in fact, by default, uh, view groups will not draw. Like anything that you extend from uh, the base view group class won't draw. If you need to, then you need to turn off the set will not draw flag. But all that aside, um, for view groups, you have to override on measure just because you want to give each child the, the, uh, the chance to measure itself and let it declare how big it wants to be. And you have to have to call on layout. Uh, number one, because it's abstract and your, your code won't compile if you don't uh, implement it, but basically because you want to call layout on each child just so that it actually appears in the screen. If you don't call layout on a child, it has like zero width and zero height uh, at position zero, zero. It kind of ends up in some kind of like nonlinear space or some kind of weird thing like that. So make sure you call layout on your children. So for this example, I'm going to take a very kind of common uh, UI, I guess, structure that we see, right? A list item with an icon, a title, and a subtitle. So this example is kind of trivial, but I actually have had to do things similar to this where I've had a list. It's got a lot of information on it. And it was actually how I really got into doing custom view groups. Because when you have a list with a lot of items and a lot of scrolling, um, you will often run into, into a kind of uh, situation where you might have to do something like this for performance reasons. So, and this is also just like a very um, straightforward layout. And if you're kind of starting to practice with your groups, this is how I would suggest that you do it. Start with something that's really easy to describe, just kind of in, con in like kind of uh, natural language, and use that as a jumping point to kind of practice with measure and layout. So, um, I'm going to start from kind of the end product and work backwards. So, what's really cool is when you do custom view groups. In XML, you can still call your custom view group just like you would any other layout. Like, you could swap in linear layout or relative layout for here, and it wouldn't look any different from your normal everyday Android. But when you do custom view groups, you can um, still do XML as normal. So here's the start of my custom view group class. There's some familiar looking things in there. I've got butter knife. I've got my kind of second constructor that's used for XML. Um, so again, we're, using a com we're doing a composite view group. That means that we have a very specific set of children we're expecting because that, we're kind of just using this for performance. So the question becomes, when can you actually uh, initialize these member variables? When can I actually bind a butter knife? So something to really remember when you're doing custom view groups is that when you're instantiating um, the view group from XML, when you're inflating it, the constructor, this constructor that takes the two um, arguments, None of the children will exist at any point in that constructor. So that can be a problem when you're using butter knife. So you have to remember this really neat callback called on finish inflate. So this only gets called when that, when that view group is being instantiated, uh, inflated rather from XML. And at that point, you can be assured that all of the children in the view hierarchy exist. And that's where we call butter knife to bind our um, member variables. OK, so um, another kind of thing that you have to look out for when you're doing custom view groups are margins and layout parameters. So I can't think of any time I've built in a UI without margins. Uh, the interesting thing is that the base view group, by default, uses the base view group layout params class, that first class I have listed up there. And the funny thing is that the base layout params class only handles width and height. Um, there's another class inside that base view group called margin layout params, which has left, top, right, and bottom, and start and end margins. But it doesn't use that by default. So if you start building your own custom view groups and don't account for that, it will actually throw away any margins that you, you um, specify in your XML. So you will often find yourself, uh, find yourself having to deal with kind of custom layout parameters when you're doing custom view groups. And it's kind of fun if, you, if you're building your own custom view group and you want to do something like add a cute attribute like um, linear layout's weight or gravity or things like that. So, um, and it's actually pretty easy to do that. There's four methods that you have to implement to kind of specify alternate layout params for a view group. Um, the first one is check layout params. It basically validates parameters. So a child view can either have no layout params or some layout params that it got from someone. We don't know where. And we have to check. It's totally possible for, say, a linear layout child to have relative layout parameters for some reason. 
maybe some like developer was up late at night and didn't have enough coffee and accidentally instantiated relative layout instead of linear layout params and um, gave them to the child. And that's why we had to kind of check, <laughs> check the layout params to make sure that they're um, valid for that layout. And there's also, um, in terms of getting uh, layout params working or custom ones working for your view group, you also have to implement three more methods that actually kind of generate layout params for you. So the first one is generate default layout params. Basically, if a parent comes across a child that's kind of not having any layout params, this will take care of generating some valid default set for them. There's also uh, generate layout params, uh, a method that takes another set of layout params as, an uh, as a parameter. And basically what happens is in a situation where you have a layout, or a child rather, that has, that has somehow gotten a hold of some invalid parameters, this method will actually take that invalid set of parameters and try to pull out any information that it can to generate some default, uh, some, some better default ones, or some better um, layout params. So, I mean, basically every view uh, group layout params has within height, right? So, even if I'm a linear layout param and I somehow see this weird aberrant uh, relative layout param, I can still use the within height of that. So, this is what that method does, is able to pull out uh, the good stuff. And, finally, there's one more, um, generate layout params that takes an attribute set. And this is basically what gets called when you're instantiating, or rather inflating your XML. And this is what pulls out all of that, the layout width and layout height, uh, layout gravity, all that stuff um, from the XML attributes and um, is able to provide them to the child view. So when you're doing view groups, um, it gets hair, it gets a little bit kind of confusing and very complex. Um, as you can see from just a little bit of code I showed you earlier, um, doing a little bit takes a lot of code. And there are some really handy methods inside of view group that can help you um, do that and just do a lot of the work for you and make it a lot better of an experience. So inside of view group, there's measure child and measure children. These are two methods that will do a lot of the work for you. So it will actually generate the mother, uh, measure spec that the parent, the, those parent constraints, it will actually generate those for you, pass them to the child and actually measure the child all in that, in that one go. Measure children is basically just calling measure child on all of the views inside of that view group. Now the problem with this is that this doesn't take into account margins. So there's another method called measure child with margins that does take into account padding, uh, margins, and actually gives you a couple extra parameters that allow you to kind of specify how much space is left in the parent. Because if you think about something like linear layout, as we're adding children or laying out children in that linear layout, there's less and less space to pass around. And this method actually gives you two parameters to specify that. Now, um, if you read the documentation for this, you'll see in basically the documentation for all three of these methods, there's something called get child measure spec that is doing the heavy lifting. Um, so basically, if you, if you have a really straightforward layout and you just need a little bit of help with uh, calling kind of the measure and doing the measure spec, you can use these methods. But say you want to do something a little bit crazy, a little bit different, a little more unique, but you still want a little bit of help generating those measure specs and, and kind of figuring out uh, what each child can uh, what the constraints for each child are, there's a method inside of um, view group called get child measure spec. And basically every single other method that I, I mentioned uses this method to generate those measure specs. So if you're wanting to do something really unique in your view group but want a little bit of help, you can still use that um, to generate your measure specs. So just really quickly, here's my simple list item um, that I'm doing. Here is the four uh, methods that allow me to use margin layout params. As you can see, it's super simple. Each one's a one-liner. Um, basically just creating some kind of uh, very simple margin layout params that will allow me to use uh, margin within my XML layout. And just to go quickly over on measure, um, it's going to be a lot of code, but it's pretty, um, it's pretty logical. Like when you are doing custom view groups, as long as you can describe how the view is laid out in kind of natural language, you can translate that fairly easy into code. So for my on measure, um, and that got clipped a little bit. But so this is the general structure that I'm going for, right? So let's say that the icon, the square, is the first thing that I want to lay out, right? It gets priority over the space. So I'm going to measure it first. And I'm actually going to go ahead and call measure child with margins. And since it gets kind of all the space, then the, the two zeros are the width used and height used, basically um, how much space has already been used by other components. So it's zero for now. I pass in measure specs. I pass in the icon itself, and that will take care of all the measuring. And then... Um, I basically have to, as I go along, I'm going to take into account each child that I've measured and then pass that along to the title. So the first kind of like long block over there. And then again, subtitle, I'm going to pass in kind of like as I go along, I'm going to increment certain things, add things together, and call, it's just use, just leverage that measure child with margins to take all the care of the work for me. Um, and that's it. That's my on measure method. 
oh, sorry, there's a little bit more, I lied. Um, now, um, once we kind of actually measure each individual child, now we have to actually allow the simple list item to say, okay, this is my measured width and this is my measured height with all of my kind of children and everything taken into account. So a little bit more math, but it's pretty straightforward. I'm basically saying, okay, between the icons width and height and its margins and the titles width and height and margins and the subtitles um, width and height and margins, um, I'm gonna add all that together and then do a little more math and call set measured dimension. It, again, it's a lot of bit of, it's a lot of code, but it's really straightforward. Um, and then similarly with on layout, when you're calling on layout, all you're really doing is calculating the um, top, left, right, and bottom, the X and Y position of each of those four corners, and then feeding them into a layout method call. So um, there's for icon, I basically calculate the X and Y. I can use the measured width and height to create that bounding box, and I pass that bounding box as four separate um, values to icon um, in the layout method. And then same thing for title view, and same thing for subtitle view. I mean, really, most of the lines of code are me commenting everything because I'm a bit of a uh, comment nut. But as you can see, it's a lot of code, but it's very straightforward. It's mostly just math and calling the right things in the right places. Um, and this is kind of just my, this is all the code put together with tons and tons of comments. So as you can see, it's verbose a little bit, but it's something that you can really do um, and very straightforward. And again, this is all, this is like the result. This is my very nice simple list item that has margins and is done all custom. So. Um, just to leave off, since I'm just about over time, um, I would totally recommend doing custom using view groups. Um, I think that it's safe to say that if you do Android long enough, you'll run into a situation where you strongly consider doing custom views, um, and you should. It just teaches you so much, and it can actually be really fun to really break things open and do your own behavior. Um, I will post the slides, but there's a lot of topics you can deep dive into um, kind of off of custom views. Um, I have a list of people that have done some very specific um, content like accessibility, um, manipulating like touch and gestures, adding custom things, but I will post those. But um, again, um, don't be afraid of custom views and view groups. They're really hard, but they can be really fun and they can really help you um, become a better Android developer. So thank you so much. <laughs>